morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our service this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome, as our speaker this morning, the Reverend Dr. John Lockington. Dr. Lockington has been with us before. We've been blessed by his ministry, and we're delighted that he's back again today to minister to us. The flowers today have been put on by David and Sarah Chambers, and we thank them for that. Also, I've been asked to announce that the pound jar in the porch uh, month of January, it contained £345. <clears throat> so therefore, uh, certainly the money is mounting up for our building fund, uh, and that's a good response during the month of January. Could I just announce, next Sunday evening, our plugged-in Cathy Church. Now, this is at 6 o'clock next Sunday evening. Uh, if you look at your sheet, you'll find that there's food, there's worship, prayer, and a message. Not necessarily all in that order, but hopefully all together on the evening. And this is for all ages. So please make a, an effort to come out next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock to our plugged-in Cafe Church. Could I also ask the members of committee just to note that there is a committee meeting on Tuesday week, the 11th of February at 7.30. The word for today, that's the Bible reading notes, they are available in the porch, they're free, so please uh, make use of them as you go out. Also, the Presbyterian Heralds are in the porch, so if you get a Presbyterian Herald, look for it uh, in the porch and take it home with you. I think this is all the announcements, and I'll hand over now to Dr. Lockington. I say a word of thank you to Craig for uh, the welcome and for looking after me. It's a confusing place to get to. They sort of give you advice, turn left and turn left again, up the stairs and around here. And I'm going for a walk again after every hymn, I'm told, so... This is the one way to keep you fit, isn't it? And even when you come to church. It's good to be here. I want to say thank you to, to Stephen, your minister, for allowing me to come and to be part of your worship today. And that's what we've come to do. So let's bow before the Lord and seek him in prayer. Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for keeping us safe as we've come here. Thank you for the desire that's in our hearts to be in this place thank you for the promise that you make that when we gather in your name, you will be with us. So we pray, Father, that you would take away from us every distracting thought. That in this place we may focus our attention, not upon the people around us or upon the building, but upon you. That we may give to you the worship that is really yours. From hearts that are really thankful for all the blessings you've given us. And for all your goodness and grace. So we commit this time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing together to God be the glory.
Let's come again to God in prayer and let's pray together. We sing our praise, Lord, to you today. And as we do that, we ask that you will give us a fresh awareness of yourself as we come before you in an attitude of prayer. We realize, Lord, that you are enveloped in glory and majesty, that you're surrounded by the splendor of heaven. And we thank you that in Jesus Christ, your Son, you have given us a glimpse of your glory. You possess such power and such might that you have brought everything in this universe into existence by the word of your power. And you sustain it. We who are part of that depend upon you for everything. Knowing your faithfulness to us in all the provision you make for us. You are the all-wise God who knows all things, who understands all the mysteries that baffle and confuse us and who sees into the very deepest recesses of our hearts and minds that nothing is hidden from you. You are so loving and so gracious that you haven't left us in our helplessness and our sinfulness, but through the Lord Jesus Christ, You come to save and rescue your people and reconcile us to yourself. You are pure and holy. Nothing evil can exist in your presence. And yet, Lord, you make it possible for people like us to fellowship with you and to know you eternally. We confess, Lord, that our our human language cannot even begin to describe who you are in all your greatness and splendor, in all your glory and majesty, in all your holiness and power and mercy and grace. And Lord, even though we sing your praises, our lips can never fully or adequately honor you. But we pray, Lord, that as we come to this place today, you would help us in all our weakness to express our thanks our gratitude to bring our worship to adore you in all your greatness. Even as we come, we confess there's so much in these lives of ours that dishonors you and displeases you and grieves you. You freely give us so generously and yet, Lord, we know that we are selfish and greedy and ungrateful. You graciously offer yourself to us in fellowship, but Lord, we spurn all that because we're so busy doing other things. Lord, you speak to us in your word. We fail to take it seriously, and indeed we don't live by it. There are impure thoughts that grip our minds and spiteful words that tumble from our lips. And our actions, Lord, can so often be self-centered and hurtful to others. Indeed, Lord, our dealing with one another is often marked by jealousy and pride and selfishness and carelessness. And even when we're involved in serving you, Lord, we can become indifferent and, and fail to really do what you want us to do. And we confess, Lord, that so often the example that we set to other people causes them to stumble and fall rather than draw them to you. Forgive us, we pray. Put our right in our lives, Lord, the things that are amiss. And as we ask for forgiveness, grant us not only your pardon, but the enabling of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to live the life you want your people to live to glorify you and to honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to read together from the book of Psalms, from Psalm 98. And we read there from the first verse. Psalm 98 and verse 1. This is God's word. 
sing to the Lord, the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen it, the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. We thank God for his word. We know that by his Holy Spirit, he will help us to understand it. Boys and girls, can you join me down at the front, please? If I get lost, come looking for me. You get lost out there, so you could, couldn't you? Too many doors. A good week at school? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, three of you did anyway. Yes. Did you learn anything? Yes. Oh, that's better still. I'm not going to ask you what you learned. Tell me this. What can you do? Let me give you my example. I can walk very fast. Show us. Show you. <laughs> you see, after the benediction, when I get to the door, see if you can get there before me. All right? Okay, I can walk fast. What, what, can, what can you do? You, what can you do? You can run fast. Brilliant. You want to show him? No? Don't worry about it. What else can you do? What can you do? I can skate fast. Can you? I could never skate at all. I kept falling off it. Good. I can stay up at night for a few few hours. You could stay up at night for a few hours. Uh, (laughs) That's a good idea. What can you do? I can play hockey. Can you? Right. You play every week? Yeah. Good. I can play football. Good. See, you can all do lots of things. What can you not do? Think, think for a minute. What, what, what can you not do? You can see the Lord Jesus. You remember that for a minute. Okay. And I want you to remember it. And have I forgotten to ask you? Okay, I'll come back to you. Is there anything else you can't do? You can't see God. You're, have you heard me before? <laughs> Can't do backflips. Can you drive an aeroplane? No. Can you can you ride a motor car? No. Can you jump up and touch the ceiling? No. You see, there's lots of things you can't do, but some people can. Some people can drive aeroplanes, and there's people who are really, really very tall, and they'd be able to jump up and touch that. But what? Tell me again, and shout it out loud because I want everybody to hear what you told me. What can you not do? See God. You can't see God. You can't see God. Nobody can see God. And the Bible says that, t- tells us that. Nobody can see God. Because God is, hasn't got a body like us. God is so, so different from us. And God is so, is so amazingly Amazingly awesome, great, and powerful, and strong. 
and we can't see him. We can see what God has made. We can see the world, but we can't see him the way we can see one another. And you know, one of the reasons is that God is what we've been talking about. God is glorious. There is a glory about God. And and that means a a brightness and and a holiness. God has no bad things in him. He can't even think bad thoughts. But let me tell you about Moses. Moses was a friend of God's. And God would speak to him very often. And God gave him work to do and things to do, like looking after his people when they were slaves in Egypt and bringing them out. But one day when God was speaking to Moses, Moses said to him, I want to see your glory. God, I want to see what, how awesome you are, how amazing you are. And God said, you can't. Nobody can see me. And Moses kept asking him. And then God said, well, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hide you among these rocks. You hide in there. And I will pass by. And you will see something. Just something. Of my glory. And that's what happened. Moses was put into the rocks hidden away so that nobody else could see and he could just glimpse out. And God said, my glory will pass, pass away from me. Now that was great, except for this, that when Moses came back down the mountain, people didn't want him to look at him. When he came down from the mountain, people just turned away from him when they saw him. And Moses had to put a veil over his face because he had seen something of the glory of God, the greatness of God, and his face was shining because of that. You and I can't see God because God is so magnificent. Next time the sun's really shining, it'll probably be about the middle of July or something, When you look up at the sun, have you ever stood and and looked up at the sun? Yes. yes. What happened to your eyes? They got sore. They got sore, didn't they? If you can think of God's brightness, God's glory as millions of times greater than that, that's why we can't see him. But here's a wonderful thing. God sees you. And God sees me, and he knows all the things that are happening in our lives. And more than that, God sees us as someone he wants to love. And he does love us. And he loved us so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to live in our world, and to go to a cross and die for us, and rise again from the dead so that all the bad things in our lives could be taken away. And we can know him with us every day. Here's the wonderful thing. We can't see God, but he is with us. Do you know he's here in this building today? You can't see him, but he's here because he's keeping his promise that he would be with his people when they come together to worship him. That's what we're doing. So while we can't see him, he still loves us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. Lord, you are so amazingly great. You are magnificent and powerful and strong and holy and pure and bright. We know we can't see you, but we thank you that you see us and you know all about us. And thank you too that you promised that when we put our trust in Jesus, you will be our Father, you will be with us every single day that we live. And you'll never leave us. Lord, I pray that the boys and girls here may grasp something of your greatness. Of how awesome you are. And that they too may know you for themselves as our Heavenly Father. Through Jesus. Amen. Before we sing, there's a, there, have any of you had a birthday? Having a birthday? No? That's great.
My birthday's soon, so I'm going to take one, one of those out of the birthday box. Will that be all right? Uh, what? No? no? Yeah. Only, Only children? No. We're not allowed? Yes, you are. Who doesn't allow me? Yes, Who says I'm allowed? Who says I'm not? We win. <laughs> We're going to sing. Okay. God is so good. Do you know this? Yes. Right, let's stand and sing. All of us. God is so good. Let's continue to worship God as we bring our offering. as we bring our gifts and offerings today, we seek through them to express our gratitude afresh to you. You are the generous giver. Everything that we have to use is from you. So accept our thanks, Lord, for all your goodness to us and use our gifts, we pray, that in your hands they may be employed to enable others to come to know Christ and that your people may be encouraged and built up in their faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's come again to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you that you give us the privilege of being able to bring our prayers for ourselves to you. And in these moments, Lord, we want to pray for others, particularly those, Lord, who are going through difficult days, those who, for whom pain and suffering is a constant experience, for those, Lord, who feel deeply the sorrow and grief of bereavement, whether it's recent or in times past, but still feel that hurt. We pray for those, Lord, who are anxious about their health, who are waiting for tests and examinations and the results of these. We pray for those who are worried about family members, parents for their children, children for their parents. We pray for those, Lord, who are burdened with financial concerns, who are finding it difficult to make ends meet. We pray for those, Lord, who are threatened with unemployment, those who are frustrated because they can't find work to do. We pray for those, Lord, who are gripped by addictions they can't escape from that are destroying them in mind and in body. We remember those who are fearful, those who are lonely, those who are discouraged, those who are depressed. Father, as we bring those in need to you, we are conscious that some of them may be sitting near us in church today. They may be members of our families. They may be among our friends, one of our neighbors, or even ourselves. Father, we ask that you would speak into their lives, that you would help them to know the the wonder of your love for them and bring to them, Lord, the peace and the contentment and the hope which trusting in you gives to all who know the sufficiency of your grace. Father, we pray for all involved in the work and witness of our congregation here. We pray for our minister, Lord, that you would remember him in the work that he is called to, that you would direct and guide him and alongside those who have oversight, responsibility, as they seek to know your will for the life of this place. Bless those, Lord, who teach boys and girls and young people, those who serve in different organizations, those who assist in worship services and use their gifts to that end, those who are responsible for the property and finance, Lord. May may everyone who plays any part in the life of this place, Lord, know the equipping and enabling of your Holy Spirit. And as each works to use the gifts you've given them, may it be for the advancement of your kingdom. Father, we pray for those in authority in the land in which we live, for those who serve in Parliament at Westminster and in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Lord, give them real wisdom in these days, we pray, in all the decisions they take, We ask, Lord, that you would work in hearts and minds to provide guidance and and direction to those to whom they have been given responsibility. We pray, Father, that you would enable those who stand for truth and for righteousness against everything that is evil that infects so much of our national life that they may be strengthened so to do. Father, we remember again those issues that confront our world. We think of those, Lord, who are caught up in the coronavirus uh, situation, not only in China, Lord, but in many other parts of the world. We pray for those who are seeking to find ways to counteract this. We pray for those, Lord, who are seeking to help those who have been infected by it. We ask, Lord, a very, in a very special way for those who are um, mission workers throughout the world and those particularly who are working in the Far East. May they know your protection upon them, Lord, to keep them from this. 
And Lord, as we pray for many other parts of our world where there is suffering for all kinds of reasons, we thank you for those who are willing and ready to give of themselves and of their gifts and abilities to bring help to them. And Lord, we need your help today. We need your help as we come to read your word together and listen to it. Lord, that you would help us to look away from where we are and what's going on in our lives, to look to you and realize, Lord, that you're speaking to us personally and individually. So give us open ears and understanding minds and submissive wills. And as we bring our prayers, we offer up them all to you, knowing that we bring them to a God who is more than capable of doing what we ask or think. And we ask it all in our Savior's name. Amen. So we sing together, Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
I don't know whether you have a Bible near you, but if you do, can I encourage you to turn with me to, to Psalm 98. It's much easier, you know, when a preacher is preaching from a passage of Scripture, if you have it in front of you. It's a great help to you. It's even more of a help to him. The Psalms were written, many of them, by David. But some are written by other people. Some are written by a man called Asaph. Some are attributed to King Solomon. Others, the sons of Korah and all kinds of things. Some of them are prayers and some of them are are marking special occasions. But many of the Psalms are written out of the, the psalmist's own experiences of life. So they deal with sin and with failure and with despair and loneliness, with antagonism with doubt, with anxiety, all the things that you and I go through in our daily lives. Psalm 98 is different. It stands out from the rest for a number of reasons. One is the the title is just a psalm. Doesn't say who wrote it. Doesn't say anything about the circumstances in which it was written. But the reality is it's full of God. It's full of God. It, 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 it's named by, by James Montgomery Boyce, the, the American preacher, as an exuberant praise song. It's a song you sing of praise to God. Because the whole focus of it is on him. You know, one of the, the, the most popular joyful carols we sing at Christmas is, is Joy to the World. You can nearly sing it in your mind, can't you? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. But it's nothing at all to do with Christmas. Isaac Watts' father, when he listened to Isaac complaining about the singing of psalms in church, said to him, why not write some poems based on the psalms? So he did. And the poem that he wrote on, on the basis of this psalm is Joy to the World. And if you think through the verses, you'll realize it's nothing to do with Christmas. And before the service ends, God willing, we're going to sing Michael Bond's version of this psalm. Sing to joy. Sing to God new songs of worship. If we're singing to the tune, Ode to Joy, it's nothing at all to do with the European Union. These words are full of joy, they're full of exuberance, they're full of enthusiasm, they're full of happiness, of worshipping God. One of the things that we are known for as Presbyterians is that we don't get joyful singing. It's not true, you know. But here's a psalm, here's a song of praise to God, and he focuses on three aspects of God's being and three aspects of God's working. Now, it's not all that has to do with God. But just let's focus on what we are being reminded of here. The God that we say we've come to love and to worship and to serve is this God who is Savior and King and Judge. If you were listening as I try to read the psalm, there was a pause there's a pause between three sections of this because each of them focuses upon one aspect of who God is. So in verses 1 to 3, he speaks about God the Savior. Three times in these verses, the word of salvation is mentioned. Why do we need salvation? Because you and I are bound by sin and by death and by Satan. And this God, this God who saves, is the God who delivers us from all of that. He delivers us from sin. You see, despite all our differences in appearance and other things about one another, there's one thing that characterizes not only you and me, but every single individual person. We're all sinners. There's no exception to that. That's part of our humanity. It's part of our human activity. It's part of our human identity. We break God's laws. 
We disobey God's word. We fail to reach the standards that he sets. We reject his claims upon our lives. And the result of that is that we're separated from him. We can't know him. We we can't enjoy him. We can't share fellowship with him. And worse than that, we deserved his punishment. Even if we wanted to, and even when we try to, we can't change that. And there's not another human being that in existence can help us. So who's able to deal with the problem? The problem that grips all of our lives? Well, it is God himself. Because he's the only one and he does it through his son, Jesus Christ, who enters into our world, who shares our life, who goes to a cross, who dies in our place and who rises again from the dead. And he saves us. He saves us from the, from the penalty of sin. As he dies on the cross, he bears what we ought to bear. He pays the penalty that we ought to pay. And he delivers us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin, so that he daily works in our lives by his Holy Spirit to, to, to enable us to live the life he wants us to live. And then one day he, he delivers us from the very presence of sin. Because in heaven there is no sin. We worship God, who is the Savior God, who delivers us from sin. But he also delivers us from death. The other bit of the truth about us is not only are we sinners, we also die. That's as inevitable as being born. And that too is the result of sin in the world. God delivers us from death. For Jesus rises again from the dead in resurrection power. He himself victorious over death. And we too share in that victory through faith in him. That's what Paul reminds the Corinthians and and us. He he says these amazing words, death has been swallowed up in victory. He gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. So so we don't live any longer under the terror of death, but we live in the absolute sure confidence that one day we will rise, new bodies, and we will be with him forever. Do you know what you do, you and I, when we meet on Sundays? We celebrate you know what we celebrate? We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But we celebrate our resurrection in him. My brother and sister never forget that. So he delivers us from sin and from death. And he delivers us from Satan. Evil has no longer any authority over us. If we do things that are wrong, that's because we have failed. Feel to depend upon his spirit fail to use the power and the victory he has given us. But he's no longer our enemy. He's no longer our our victor. He's no longer the one who controls us. The Spirit of God controls us, and he is defeated, and we are able in the Spirit to resist him. Now, here's the truth that is emphasized in all of this. This is the Lord's doing. There's nothing that you and I can contribute to this. Some of you are trying to. I know that. You're trying to achieve all of this by, your, by yourself and, and, and your good deeds and your respectability and all the other things that so many people depend upon. And they're, they're all a failure. <coughs> Salvation is of God. Only of him. And there is nothing of us in this. It is... His right hand, his holy arm, his salvation, his righteousness, his love, his faithfulness. That's who this God is. Didn't you enjoy singing that first hymn? Mark picked it. I didn't, but I'm glad he did. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Do you know the great thing he has done for you? is to save us from sin and from death 
and from hell. Has he? Has he? Then in verses 4 to 6, there is the second verse, as it were, of this, of this song. And he affirms that God is the king. And, and it's not only in this psalm, but, but psalms that are, are really around this one. Psalm 93 begins with similar words. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. In Psalm 97, the one before this, the Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. In Psalm 99, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. The Lord reigns, that's what he's saying here. And they're echoing this basic truth. God is king, not just the king of Israel. He is the king of the universe. The one he has created. So he is sovereign. You know, you begin to talk about the sovereignty of God. You could be here for a long time. But let me just touch on something. The sovereignty of God, the fact that God is king, affirms his majesty. And when we speak of the majesty of God, we speak of his greatness. There is none like him. And as sovereign, he is all-knowing and all-seeing and all-powerful and absolutely free. He's not limited in any way. He's eternal. He doesn't change. He can't abdicate. He can't be usurped. He rules today as he always has and he always will. He is king. In complete control, with absolute authority. You know, if you turn to Revelation chapter 4 and the the early verses of that chapter, um, John is given a vision of heaven. And he's he's brought to see what, what heaven is like. And in chapter 4, we read of how he is told to come up and have a look. And what is the first thing that he sees? There before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And all around the throne, there are those who sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. In in heaven, there is the Lord God Almighty, ruling over everything. Let me just focus on one aspect of that, because this is of comfort to God's people. So that if you have received this salvation, if you, if you know the Lord through his son Jesus, that knowledge that God the Lord rules and reigns in sovereign power and glory brings assurance to your soul. And it brings strength to you and it brings succor to you. And isn't that so apt? In the days in which you and I live, don't, you don't need to be reminded, reminded of what's happening in your community and in the land and in the world because you're bombarded with it day in and day out. And you knew you could be easily overwhelmed by all of that. It could just crush you by all the turmoil, all the uncertainty, all the, the seeming chaos. And that will happen in your life if you take your eyes off the one who is sitting on the throne of heaven. Because on that throne is the Lord God Almighty. Spurgeon tells the story of a man called Bulstrode Whitelock, which is an interesting name. He was sent by Oliver Cromwell to Sweden at a time when there were all sorts of problems in, in England. When the when the Dutch were at war with England and where there was political confusion, very little changes. And he was sleeping or trying to sleep one night on his way, making his way to Sweden. He was in Horwich waiting for a boat. But he couldn't sleep. His mind was going over all these things. And a confidential servant was sleeping in a bed quite close to him. 
And realizing he couldn't sleep, he at last said to his master, Sir, can, can I ask you a question? And of course the answer was yes. Sir, do you believe that God could rule the world before you come into it? Of course. And sir, do you believe that God will be able to rule the world when you're out of it? Absolutely. But sir, do you not believe that God can quite easily govern it now when you're still in it? And wait, look turned in his bed and went to sleep. You know, to know that God is in control in sovereign power is amazing. You may have heard of, of Maud Kells. If you don't, there's a life story of Maud uh, recently produced called An Open Door. Get a hold of it and read it. Wonderful story. An amazing woman. And near the end of the book, Maud writes how God worked in her life. Here are her words. The longer I live, the deeper my understanding that God is sovereign. He is in control of everything that happens. My brother and sister, listen, have you learned to trust the God who is sovereign? The God who is king? Because you see, knowing that he is helps us to really realize that he's the only one that you can really trust in and depend upon. But always remember this. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. But his thoughts are always good. And our ways are always right. Even though on this side of eternity we cannot understand them. Look away from all of this that's going on around you. And see the throne. See the throne. So he speaks, does the psalmist, and and worships and rejoices and praises God that he is that he is the saviour God and that he is the king. And then the last stanza really brings us to a very different picture. For this is God the judge. The psalmist encourages us to sing and to praise God that he is saviour and that he is king. And that's easy to do. But listen, it's not so easy whenever you come to be asked to sing praise to the fact that God is judge. You'll not find too many songs or hymns that focus upon the judgment of God. But it's part of him. And there's some people recoiled from this very idea that, that God should judge. But this, this is something that you find throughout the whole of Scripture. And if you refuse to accept that God is a judge simply because you don't understand it, means that you haven't a clue who God is and what God is like. There is an inevitable final judgment of every one of us. Because God is holy, and because God is just, and because God is sovereign. What Paul was preaching to the Athenians, he said this, God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's a sobering fact, isn't it? To realize that history ends just as life ends. And in Hebrews we read this, Just as a man or a woman is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. You, you, are you the kind of person who refuses to accept that reality? And ignore the warnings that you may have been given for years and years and years. That in the light of the fact that God will judge you one day, the only thing you can do is turn to Christ and call upon him to be your saviour. You see, it's only then that you can face the the inevitable future knowing that there is no condemnation, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus because he has paid the penalty and we go free.
If you're a Christian this morning trusting in Jesus, I want you to remember this so that it will bring peace to your soul that must be troubled by what is happening in the world. We live in a society and in a world where good people suffer, where evildoers go free, where the wicked prosper and oppressors succeed. Where people, where people escape from the judgment, the justice that they really deserve. And where there are many miscarriages of justice. And it troubles us. And we feel disappointed. Remember this, in the midst of all those experiences, the truth is there is a time coming when all the undetected crimes are solved because they're uncovered. Where all sin is judged. Where all the unfairnesses and the wrongs of life are made right and all the injustices are corrected. You know, people can't avoid... God seeing into our minds and hearts. Nothing is secret from him. And he makes no mistakes. His judgment is perfect. And no one escapes from it. So when you and I as believers remember that God is a judge. We remember that no one escapes that judgment. Because his judgment is just. And it's only the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that covers you as a believer, means you escape from that. The judge in all the earth always does what is right. Running through this psalm, there is a a call to individuals and indeed to the nations and all of creation to sing praise to God. This 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 God, this amazing God. But you see it's more than that. There is a there is a challenge and a call for us to respond to him. How do you respond to the God who is the Saviour? You either say no to him or yes to him. What's it to be? What is it? There's a call for you and for me, if we are believers, to obey the king. To acknowledge that he is sovereign Lord. And his will is good. And there's a call for us to humble ourselves before him. And be ready to meet him. Who is the judge of all the earth. I don't know what the Lord has been saying to you. But he has spoken, for it is his word. Now, how are you and I to respond? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for helping us to lift our eyes away from ourselves to you. To realize that you are the God who saves who saves sinners like us and who have done it at a most amazing cost. Help us to remember that you are king. You are the one who is in control of all things. While we cannot understand how or why you work, we bow before you. We acknowledge that you are the God who knows everything and who does everything well. Remind us again, Lord, that if we stand before you one day without without the righteousness that Jesus gives us through his death and resurrection, we have no hope and no future. Lord, whatever it is you're saying to us as someone who has never come to trust in Christ, bring us to that place. If you've spoken to those of us, Lord, who know you and love you, strengthen our faith, strengthen our confidence in you, 
and help us never to forget to give you the praise and the honor and the glory that is yours for the wonderful God that you are. And we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. So we're going to sing. Sing to God new songs of worship. grace and mercy and peace from you who are Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain and abide with us this day and forever. Amen.